What I'm going to be discussing uh, is a series of sort of online text-based audio and visual resources that a group of colleagues and I have de developed and we're, the resources are aimed at researchers who are embarking on these indigenous and non-indigenous research partnerships. And what we're doing in particular is looking uh, to support non-indigenous researchers to think about our methods and our assumptions and our behaviour. Um, and there are six of us in the team behind the resources. I'm working in partnership with two indigenous researchers, uh, Helen Mawak Barnes, uh, who's director of the Verkiri Research Group at Massey University in New Zealand, and Deborah McGregor, who holds a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Environmental Justice. And the other members of our team, one of whom is here, is Tula Branerly. Hey. So it's a bit nervous for me. <laughs> uh, she's at, Tula is at Bournemouth University and she's been involved in several uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous research partnership projects. Um, there's also uh, Chris Garrington, who is a communications expert, and Olivia Hicks, who is our comic artist. And, and it, an important point is that actually this project uh, built on uh, existing international networking between us. So it didn't just come from nowhere um, uh, with me sort of contacting people I didn't know and I didn't have established relationships with in response to a call from a funding agency. Um, and the production of the resources is uh, a grant under the UK Research and Innovation, UK, known as UKRI which is uh, funded, uh, it's funded by government. And our team then applied to UKRI for funding for this project under their international collaboration scheme. Now the context for our project is the Global Challenges Research Fund, uh, known as GCRF, sorry about all these acronyms, uh, which is part of uh, the UK government's official development assistance strategy. And the uh, funding scheme supports research partnerships between the UK and developing country researchers. And it supports them to address uh, a set of defined challenges uh, that are faced by developing countries. So on the one hand, uh, the GCRF is aiming to promote what it refers to as, uh, as you can see the last part of the quote there, equitable partnerships between researchers, practitioners and policy makers in both developed and developing countries. On the other hand, it's clear where the actual problem identification and the solution expertise for that lies. Uh, it is the GCRF that defines what the UK considers global challenges. So to, to go to the start of the quote on this slide, it says that the GCRF aims for UK research excellence to be deployed in strategic and coherent way to understand and suggest solutions to the most significant and complex problems faced by the developing world, while at the same time strengthening research capability in developing countries. So the knowledge, the expertise uh, and the skills lie in the UK and, the, and in the dominant Euro-Western model of research. Um, but that model has been uh, challenged by uh, the decolonisation movement and by indigenous methodologies. So the, a context for our GCRF, uh, for, for GCRF as a, a, a scheme itself and, and for our programme is that for indigenous and non-indigenous research partnerships, there are these uh, historical, there is this context of historical and ongoing colonisation. So historically there's been mainly Western uh, migration to and settling on Indigenous lands and, and settlers have ruled over and oppressed Indigenous peoples. Um, and, they, and we have been and are appropriating and profiting from Indigenous peoples' resources and knowledge at the same time as we are denigrating indigenous cultures and, and knowledge. 
And having an academic uh, indigenous and non-indigenous research partnership can actually perpetuate that exploitative relationship. It can be replicated in how the research focus gets defined, uh, in relationships between the indigenous and non-indigenous researchers on the research team as well. Now, all research methodologies are grounded in the specificities of people's worldviews, in their, what we call their epistemologies. And what's referred to as a, a northern epistemology, that assigns authority uniquely to knowledge production that is founded in Euro-Western dominant social viewpoints and histories of colonialism. The Western Academy sets the agenda, it constructs the rules by which the world, including the worlds of indigenous peoples, how they are theorised, how they're investigated and how they're judged. And that dominant system determines what is knowledge, what, gets, what are legitimate research questions and what are legitimate answers. And it assumes that, that this version of what counts as knowledge and how it should be best be formed, that that applies universally. But it, the epistemology originates within and it sees from what we call a global north point of view. And the imperial sort of cultural paradigm, the processes of this global north from which these abstracted claims of university are springing, it, it, it's, but it's invisible, we don't see it um, as being there. Moving on to think about southern epistemologies, they are rooted in actually in the societies and the peoples of the global south. They uh, detach what counts as knowledge and how it's produced and how it's used. They, the attempt is to detach it from imperialism and challenge power structures. So southern epistemologies are acknowledging that Knowledge is diverse, uh, it's evolving, there are sets of intellectual traditions and the methodologies that are associated with this are contextualised. They aim to be non-extractive ways of finding out about the world. So in contrast to the northern epistemology, southern epistemologies, uh, ways of thinking that are advanced, can advance plural, conceptual and spiritual approaches to knowledge and to the ethical process of inquiry. And the reason they do this is to understand what are the constellations of oppression and the injustices that stemmed from colonialism, what are the struggles and the resistances to them, and what are the social and environmental processes and relations and transformations uh, that are alterna alternatives. So if we're going to create a space for valuing Southern epistemologies when we are actually pursuing these indigenous and non-indigenous research partnerships, then what we need to do is to work at uh, decolonizing both the research and the researchers. So decolonizing research is about actually dismantling uh, the distortions, the erasures in global, global Northern epistemologies and methodologies and how researchers are positioned within that. And you say you're, you're, you're trying to dismantle that and, and open up new forms of knowledge beyond the European Western uh, modes of research. Uh, Decolonising researchers involves actually challenging our assumptions, challenging our position, trying to free ourselves up from these underlying global North academic culture and to offer alternative ways of understanding the world that relates to indigenous peoples. Now there is a, a growing and really vibrant literature on indigenous methodologies. You can see that from these selected examples. There is no one single uh, indigenous research paradigm. It's very richly diverse. Approaches span qualitative and quantitative research methods. They run across a range of social and behavioural and natural sciences. In fact, I'd, I'd say actually they are beyond disciplines, not interdisciplinary, beyond disciplines. Uh, and they embrace a variety of substantive issues. 
But there are some common foundations, I think, uh, in trusting relationships, in the need for transparent accountability, and in the aim to actually fundamentally transform the whole nature of research and it, the research endeavour. So, I mean, we may think in, in Western-dominated mainstream re research, we do often uh, aspire to be transformative, uh, but we do that often in ways that are defined by powerful interests, um, government and, and businesses. Uh, and that actually is evident in the Global Challenges Research Fund that I mentioned earlier. I'll never get funding again. Um, but indigenous research um, is actually s aspiring to be critical, transformative, to benefit the community or the collective grouping as they define that themselves. And Western dominated research is uh, often when it looks at indigenous peoples, often challenges as being deficit based, it identifies needs and risks and it attempts to solve social problems that are identified as challenges, as I said, by government. Um, indigenous research, though, it might aspire to questions or purposes concerned with well-being, self-determination, sovereignty and rights and so on. So given everything I've just said, why on earth would any self-respecting indigenous researcher want to collaborate on research projects with non-indigenous researchers? So that actually is a question that uh, I ask my indigenous colleagues. Um, now I could see the benefits to non-indigenous researchers like me uh, because the research partnerships involve you in collegial uh, and appropriate approaches to gaining knowledge about people's lives. Uh, that can give you a better understanding of a community's needs, about how to meet those needs uh, on the community's own terms. And my colleagues tell me that for indigenous researchers such as them, um, that having research partnerships with uh, trusted non-indigenous researchers can provide them with uh, supportive allies in addressing contemporary uh, challenges that face indigenous peoples in appropriate ways. And that collaborations also can help to gain respect for indigenous approaches and knowledges. But in order for that to be the case, it is important for researchers to think about their expectations and their practices across the whole research process, which is why we are producing the indigenous and non-indigenous research partnership project while we're producing the set of online and audio and visual resources. Now th these resources do not offer a definitive blueprint, I have to stress that, but what our, res our website does is introducing decolonizing ways of understanding and researching, provides this set of resources that can act as prompts to start people thinking about the challenges and the tensions in partnership working. So I'll just take you briefly through what we've posted so far. So uh, there is an audio resource uh, where our project team are discussing good and proud practice in indigenous research and uh, non-indigenous research collaboration. Uh, we're producing illustrations to accompany the discussion. They aren't quite finished yet, but uh, there's a draft of one up on the PowerPoint slide there. As you can see, the world is turned upside down. Um, in the audio team discussion, we cover how indigenous researchers will be stepping outside their comfort zone in working in partnership with indigenous researchers. Uh, we cover the legacy of colonialism and how that continues to impact on the way research is undertaken on indigenous communities. Uh, the, we look at the, we discuss the dangers and the risks that are inherent in researchers from predominantly Western backgrounds trying to enter into partnership with indigenous researchers and peoples and what are indigenous researchers experience of this. Uh, we talk about the lack of information on partnership working that's available to non-indigenous researchers and the methods and approaches and, uh, and what works, what doesn't in an indigenous context and what good collaboration looks like, how, how collaborations start, evolve and lead to research that can benefit indigenous communities. 
So I, I'm hoping to play you a brief, we always say that when we've got anything that's involving technology, I'm hoping to play you a brief clip where Chris, who is our communications producer, asks me and Helen about the risks that are involved in, uh, in Indigenous, non-Indigenous research partnerships. Okay, so I have to say that actually making this recording was this uh, massive endeavour because Helen is in New Zealand, Deborah is in Canada, me and Tula are in the UK and we actually probably had about an hour where we were all awake at the same time. So it was... Okay, so we are in the process of producing a comic as a visual resource. Uh, that people can use in discussion about what effective collaboration would look like. Um, and the, uh, you saw one of the frames from the work in progress uh, comic on the slide that I showed you about epistemologies. Uh, here are some more. The basic story in the comic is that researchers in the UK are collaborating with a, a Maori researcher in New Zealand um, and through that they learn um, what it is to conduct good partnership research, that they can't actually rush the project without consulting with and listening to and respecting the knowledge and the input of the Maori community. And it goes, it tell, this, the story tells about how they went about doing this and working with their co-researcher. Um, finally, we have an ongoing series of blog posts where Indigenous and non-Indigenous researchers share their experiences. So far, we've got uh, blogs on consent and accountability, on the ethics of writing, on care-based approaches, and on rights-based frameworks. And coming up, we've got uh, shortly further blogs, including on the concept of co-design, arts-based approaches, and third space collaborative projects, and hopefully one from Ian as well. Uh, so I hope that I have stimulated your interest in the resources that our Indigenous and non-Indigenous partnership website provides you. And I hope that you'll take the time to visit it and find it useful.